let's get our panelists onto the stage. Uh, we have uh, Tao Tran, who is the uh, Partner Development Manager. Uh, Dion Alma, uh, Engineering Director. Yeah, come on, yeah, go and take a seat. Uh, yes, yeah, so Dion Alma, Engineering Director. We've got Parisa Tabriz, uh, who is, well, Tana's browser boss in her work bio, so I'm gonna go with that. Darren Fisher, VP of Engineering, who uh, you met right earlier. <laughs> Greg Simon, Engineering Director. Alex Komorowski, uh, Product Manager. Uh, Dmitry Glaskov, engineering lead, and Grace Klober, principal engineer. So let's, uh, let's see what questions. I haven't really looked at these yet, so I, I hope they're good. Um, we haven't either. Right. So question one. How many HTML tags are in the HTML spec? No, I can't. This is the wrong question list. One second. Hang on. Let me, let me figure this out. Too many. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably too many. Okay, I should say we have some microphones set up. We've got um, got one here uh, and we've got one over here. If you uh, want to ask a question live uh, for our, our panelists here, that is something uh, you can do. Oh, I mean, we've got someone being very brave, so I'm you know, I'm not going to ignore that. Should we take a, a question from the audience straight away? It's going to be very targeted. Can we get that microphone on so you can hear the question? There you okay. go. Uh, now this is going to be a very specific one for such a big panel, um, but it hits close to home. It has to do with messaging across Google as a whole, in particular how it affects Chrome. Uh, Hangouts. I use it personally. I use it in business. And the app versus extension has been shifting and fluxing. And recently the extension uh, has broken entirely. We were pulling it off of uh, GitHub because of a feature that was pulled out of Chrome, the docking feature. It seems like a, a decision that had to have come from a lot of different places that would have affected a lot of users and doesn't seem like it needed to happen as a breaking change. And I'm wondering if you can tell me anything about the process and how something like that comes to be you know, in the Chrome ecosystem. So, I mean, there's no one here on the panel who works specifically on Hangouts, but does anyone want to take a stab at that? we can at, talk at, about at, the, the API in question hmm? a bit. Um, anyone else, feel free to jump in too. But, in this particular case, there was an API developed um, specifically for Hangouts. And oftentimes, when you build an API like that that's specifically only for a one first party application, it's a lot harder to build an, an API that's going to stand the test of time and really hold up and, in fact, be implemented well on all platforms. And in this particular case, we were left with the question of do we try to, try to really make this thing work well, even though we have, well, it was really only built for a specific application, or do we move beyond it? And the decision was to sort of move beyond it because it, it wasn't something we felt like we could actually build in a solid fashion. So I, I kind of want to, to lead on from, from that question a little bit more. Um, so uh, the things we promote here, things like you know being uh, progressive, you know accessibility, working in all browsers, I mean that is something that we don't see happening across the websites that Google actually produces. Is is there something that we can do there? Are there are there efforts there? Is that something we can change? Uh, Dimitri, do you want to take this one? Is that from a, a, a polymer standpoint, is that something that we can power that? I would love to see that changed. I, I think uh, Google does need to play a larger role in the progressive web apps uh, ecosystem, and it does need to uh, kind of get on this train. This train is moving. Tao was telling us all about it. Um, I, I'm doing all I can to make that happen. <laughs> and. Um, Y'all can help me with that too. So that's uh, you know that's also a call for help. So if anyone has any, oh God, we'll we'll do the live ones because uh, you know. So uh, we, are, we don't have many of these. This question is about promises. Hmm. I know you have been uh, very happy about promises, but personally, I find it horrible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are you, it, in the next few sentences, are you going to say the word observables? <laughs> <laughs> just no, just a prediction. I, 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 Actually, I think it's kind of stuck between uh, two different promises. Uh, one being trying to become simpler, like not having nested callbacks, and the other one trying to have uh, like parallel execution, like promise all, and ended up being neither. It's kind of really, really complex at this given point in time. Why is it, why is it these two different objectives taken in one single thing and complicated? I mean, is it is it my personal experience? I don't know, but uh, I think it's kind of it has two objectives and it has not met met both. Well, I, I mean, I, how have you have you used uh, async 
uh, awaits, like the, where you sort of you feel like you're writing a, a synchronous function, but you're, you're using promises. Have you found that's helped the problem at all? Uh, I'm saying, you know, uh, you, you're saying from uh, nested callbacks because you have uh, then it makes it easier. It doesn't necessarily, right? I think the problem seems to be that uh, if if you if you really try and uh, build that, you are having a sequential execution, right? But you really don't have the if then kind of structure that you would normally do in the in the in the sequential execution. Uh, and and also, you know, most of the time when you are having multiple execution, uh, you suggest doing like promise all, like building that. Uh, structure, and anyway, you have lost the whole structure anyway. You have to rethink the whole thing, right? I, I think, so uh, tomorrow we have Seth Thompson speaking from uh, uh, V8, uh, but we also have um, Alex Russell, uh, who's on TC39. I think so speaking to him about that would probably be better than anyone right. here, yeah. if anyone's got probably, anything to say yeah. about that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, Alex Russell, who spoke earlier, he's around this evening. He's a good one to talk to right. about that. I, I think personally, if, if as a developer, if I don't find it useful, uh, it's easy. I think that is what you should look at it as an end result. Maybe it's still easier for you guys because you, you're designing the system. But that's, that's a really great that's feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one of the questions I have here, which is, which I think has popped up on every time we've done um, this panel thing, is is that uh, are there plans or discussions taking place around making progressive web apps discoverable in the Play Store alongside native apps? And it's interesting that that gets a round of applause because I always think like. If only there was some kind of discovery platform on the web <laughs> for things. If only one company would step forward <laughs> and make such a thing. But pe sort of people the like point. their Play Stores. By the way, there was not enough clapping. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a round the, of applause. The clap clap that point there, I think. <laughs> don't pity me. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, I think uh, to some extent is you can look at app stores to some extent as almost a, a failure that the web already had that piece. Like we. App stores were necessary because there was no other way to get these things. And yes, it has become something on mobile that I think uh, some users expect it to be there. But what users also expect is that when you tap a link in anything, it will load up that experience. Yeah. And so I think it is an interesting other source. I'd like to see how, as we evolve these things, what we can do in that space. But ultimately, I think it, it kind of underplays the strength of URLs on the web that are like its superpower. At, at the same time, I could totally see the point that if you are in an app ecosystem today, yeah. Uh, it is important for you to, you know, quack, quack like a duck, right? You know, you're, you need to behave like in, in other players in that app ecosystem. So I, I can totally see it. Yeah. And I think especially as with like the improved add to home screen that we we're talking, that Darren was talking about earlier today, I think as these things become more and more, uh, so they fit in more and more like apps, I think users might uh, bring over more and more of those conceptions. Yeah, so. and I was talking to someone who had like a games portal that that was their app, so to speak, and then they wanted to mint other apps. So you're in their thing and you want to grab an app. Well, wouldn't it be nice to have the flexibility yeah. for use cases like that that make sense to be able to do that, to have a meta app that can mint other apps and the like. And we have these nice things with being able to put paths and scopes and URLs and subdomains so we could actually you know, look at you know, being able to deliver those types of things. Like a PWA that like delivers a set of other PWAs, <laughs> and then you can like go to them, and a, then you can add portal. those to your home screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty good idea. Maybe a search <laughs> thing. Get Yahoo to, to build one, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Tao, like, do, do you hear this a lot from partners wanting wanting this feature? And what, what do you think makes people really want to be in, in, in the store? Um, I think it's more about just discovery overall, right? So why not have both platforms be uh, be at your disposable? <laughs> I mean, at, at your disposal in terms of discovery, right? So I don't think. Um, I, I think for most people, they, they understand like the web, um, you know, is great and, ha and has a superpower of, of, of reach. But uh, at the same time, having another place to have uh, your, uh, you know, progressive web app be available is just additive in terms of in in terms of discovery. Um, and, and especially if, if people are in a mindset that the first thing they do is you know click on, you know, the the Play Store icon or the App Store in order to discover content. Right? It's just about giving people as many opportunities um, to actually find your stuff. Um, and so on, on mobile device, it's uh, the Play Store or the App Store. And I think to some extent, too, like what, what we shipped with Add to Home Screen first, that wasn't the final thing. We've been evolving that. It's kind of been a journey. And I think we aren't done yet, I guess. So. Yeah. 
We'll take another question from the audience. Friendly face, hello? Yeah, hi. seeing Jake, should I talk about streams? Or really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, my question is a two-parter one. Uh, I've been seeing throughout the day that Google is not just building for a single browser, but, for, but building for the web. Uh, what's stopping it from influencing uh, uh, Chrome and iOS uh, to have service worker, or Safari to have service worker? And the second part is uh, extending the, the add to home screen part. Uh, would it be possible to have a direct link saying add to home screen when we search for, uh, say, some web apps? And we know that we have a manifest file already, so it would it be nicer to say like add to home screen directly from the link. Would, would, is, is, this, is, that, is it technically challenging, and why is that not happening? Or okay, so, yeah, so the, the first part of that is like, what, what can we do about uh, Chrome on iOS? What more can we do there? Grace, do you want to take this one? I think for the iOS is, for the service worker, uh, we, Very limited. The, yeah, so, the, <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, we don't, we have to like using the WK web view, right? So we don't really have a lot of choices. And what we can do is try to influence uh, Apple to put a service worker into the web, uh, into the WK web view, so which is uh, means, uh, old apps like browser Asia based app on iOS can enjoy it. Yeah. And part of things I think for us to demonstrate how it works well in Android, and then I mean we need you guys to build in the app using the service worker, and the user can see the difference benefit, and then hope that can influence Apple to changing adding the service worker Absolutely. into the WP. Yeah, yeah. You go make your web experiences much, much faster on Android because you're using the service worker. And so if you're an iPhone user, the web is slow. And if you're an Android user, the web is fast. Yeah, and there's actually yeah, uh, Apple representatives here. It's been really great for them to, to show up at the event as well as Mozilla and Opera and all these other folks. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, if you, uh, uh, I don't know if we have a polymon for them so you can't catch them, but <laughs> if, if you can find them, like talk about you know, what, what you want from Safari. Yeah, this yeah. actually came up last year's Chrome Dev Summit uh, on a talk about benchmarks, and really that's the ultimate benchmark, right? It is like, my, well, my website runs much faster for users on this, this browser versus another. That, that beats every, any synthetic benchmark out there. So. Yeah. I'm gonna do one more question from here before coming back to uh, yep. people on the microphones. Uh, how am I users like, Oh yeah, you did ask. Yeah. You did ask two yeah. parts. Yeah, I can, uh, <laughs> it, it was about at home screen from the search page directly because we know yeah. that these apps would have manifest JSON in them. Yes. So I think so it's really that's, a, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think it's like a, for the search result page, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, we're actually definitely looking into that with the search team. Yeah. yeah. Hoping to see that soon. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, how might users' expectations of, of the security model change when a web app is launched from the home screen? Parisa, do you want to take this one? So, it, it feels like a native app, so should it be able to do all of the stuff a native app can do? Feels like a native app. Um, I, I worry about this, actually. Uh, there is a different security model for native applications, or uh, whether it's on a phone or, or any computer, and, and the web. and um, there's great, I, I think that, you know, we have an opportunity to merge that experience and actually make it more immersive between native applications and websites, especially on the phone. But uh, most users don't understand the security model differences. Most, and you shouldn't need to. Most developers don't necessarily uh, need to. And now we have kind of native apps asking for permissions and websites asking for permissions. And uh, users don't necessarily know which is which, especially as we kind of evolve the, the UI between these two things. Um, the question, was the question specifically asking Yeah, is, what? Is, is, are there any things we would grant if, if the app was added to home screen that we wouldn't if it was a website? Is, is there anything there we would infer? Well, one thing we, we do is full screen. Yeah, so yeah. We'll hide the omni that, that is already happening today, yeah. that you do get the durable storage, for example, and things like this. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there is, there is a lot of things that are already happening that, you know, add to home screen is such a strong signal. Uh, from the user that they want to engage with the site that we sort of do, do have some affordances. Yeah. But there is, like you pointed out, a really interesting line to walk. And uh, Yeah, and I, and I think I don't think of it as like this is less secure, but I mean you're getting more capabilities and, and with those capabilities come, you know, risk of abuse. So I think I mentioned earlier today that we were looking at uh, auto granting the notification permission when the user mm -hmm. goes to the add to home screen flow. And, and part of that too is as these uh, with the improved add to home screen, it feels much more like uh, an app in many other ways. And so on Android, for example, you native apps get that permission uh, to push notifications by default. Yeah, and, and I, so I think that's, um, 
I don't think you always want to ask. I think there's there's a tendency to say, well, we should, you know, always ask for permissions, but people get desensitized to constantly being asked to, to grant permissions, and then you've lost any, you know, security benefit that that question was going to be asked. So I think there's a lot of work we're doing into finding out uh, the balance for, you know, any any capability. And the more powerful it is, I think the more, you know, thought we put into where that balance is. But I think there's a non-security aspect too of just like when you tap on this, what should show up? Should it feel like a web page? Should yeah. it feel like an app? And uh, someone actually in the in the audience, or it was definitely earlier in the audience, showed me they'd taken a native app, an Android app, and they'd port it to a PWA. And they were going through how like it was basically you know perfect fidelity, other than the fact that they couldn't affect the screen brightness for this one scanner piece. And mm -hmm. as I was sitting, there, I was like, well, I remember like a couple of years ago, we'd be going, oh, the web can't do this, it can't do this, until I'd be talking about like the screen brightness is like the one thing left that it can't do. <laughs> it was kind of like, pinch me, pinch me. Right? <laughs> and so thank you guys so much for building these great experiences that they actually really do feel like. And you know, when my kid goes up and taps on this icon, he really doesn't know what technology and definitely shouldn't care I don't know what's what going on. I mean, I, yeah. I mean I, a lot of people don't know, and I think that's awesome, right? Like, you just want to enjoy, I mean, you don't, yeah, you shouldn't need to care, and I think, uh, well, I think what you said before about the people not understanding the security model, I, I think that's true. One of the things that sort of terrifies me about native apps is is the power they have just over making web requests. I mean, I think as developers, we complain about cores quite a lot. It's it's a bit of a pain, but it also terrifies me that native apps, like if, if you've got anything in your house or in your company that you kind of think, well, I don't need to put this behind a password because it's internal only, any native apps on people's phones on the same network are just able to, to read and write from that. Yes. I mean, the, the web's security model is somewhat paranoid almost, but mm -hmm. that paranoia is a strong word, but is what allows us to have that really low friction. You know, it's no accident when you tap a link, it goes right to it even if it's a different domain. That's part and parcel of the 25 years of the security model we've been developing in, in a maintaining and strengthening. I'm starting to feel like security model is a trigger word for this panel because we've been discussing <laughs> this yeah. question for a little while. Let's take a couple more questions from the audience. So, let's stop that. So you guys touched on it a little bit already, but it seems like uh, you guys are kind of encouraging developers to go more towards, uh, obviously, PWAs versus something like Chrome package apps, which is what uh, my company has been developing for several years now kind of jumped on it right when you introduced that. So the question was, I see that there's like this migration strategy and not all the APIs that we need are there yet. And so I was actually talking to Darren, sounds like there's definitely hope for that, but there's still something in the education area, which is that these are usually Chromebooks or some kind of device that is managed. So how do, what is, what is the strategy for, uh, let's say a school district be able to push these applications to a set of devices that are strictly managed. Where are we going with Chrome Apps then? Who wants to take that one? So I think, I, I think as we as we look through this, like this was not an easy decision, obviously. And ultimately, we care a lot about the open web and the, uh, what we call the linkable web, the ability for people to be exposed to lots of different uh, diverse experiences relatively easily. I think there we definitely there's a number of gaps between what was possible in Chrome Apps it was a quite different security model uh, in Progressive Web Apps. For that particular case, I mean, I, I can imagine how that would work about how we could push an icon, uh, and then maybe that icon is pushed, we fetch uh, and boot up the service worker in an off-screen uh, tab to give it a chance to sort of fetch the things it needs. Um, we we really want to hear feedback from people like you about the, the gaps like that that are in place so that we can work to address them and make sure that we offer the best solutions we can for that. And for what it's worth, it does not seem like a, 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 anything but a technical problem that we probably should tackle. Yep. Um, this this problem is probably also relevant in many other applications. For example, for uh, um, next billion users, where you might have offline a lot and you actually might have to resort to some peer-to-peer -peer swapping of progressive web applications. I can imagine a world like this. And uh, what is that? How is that different from uh, what you described? Except yours is, um, you know, a, sl a slightly different application of the same type of technology. So I totally see this. This is a possible thing. At the end of the day, progressive web apps work really great on desktop as well. And there's there's really nothing stopping us from. Uh, fleshing out those details so that uh, the, the enterprise management features of Chrome OS and so on uh, work work well for pushing uh, PWAs. Is there, can I, can I just want one more thing, can I, where's, how can we give feedback to Chrome team for things like this? Because 
for a lot of like shopping sites and stuff like that, it seems like there's a lot of you know people who are in that space that you can feed off of. But for education, it's a very different market and it's very narrow. So, so we love uh, getting feedback from all developers. Like um, we, almost everything we do is fully an open source, and there's a reason for that. We love when people come on the ma various mailing lists and give us feedback. So very specifically on this issue, when we announce this change on the Chromium blog, there's a link to a, either a feedback form or a mailing list. Um, and we really encourage you to, to engage there because like, that's, that's, this is a great example of a thing that we should just do, right? So, great, thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, as the modern web application's goal is to make the user experience better and uh, make the web applications native, right? So in that case, if the user uses the web application for the most of the time, the memory consumption of the web application is also matters. So uh, I'm glad that we have uh, debugging tools to identify where the memory leakages are in Chrome. Like, but what are the suggestions do you give to the developers to prevent the memory leakages, or what are the areas that developers should concentrate to s prevent the memory consumption? I've, I've, that's one of the things that I found the most difficult thing to debug on web pages, despite the dev tools we've got. Um, Who's going to fix it? We are going to fix it. <laughs> uh, gonna fix it. Yeah, this is, this is actually a, a huge pain point for us. Uh, we've invested a bunch of um, um, effort into trying to understand uh, memory usage ourselves inside of Chrome uh, this year. And I think, um, I don't know if you, you, you are feeling it, but uh, we definitely know our graphs are all you know, going down in terms of memory consumption. And I think. Uh, the actual developer experience is next. It's very hard to do your right. Greg is actually one of the pioneers of this uh, back in the day where he uh, uh, went and engaged with the Gmail team and built them a little bot that runs Gmail for, what, 72 we hours? Gmail for many, many days. Right, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, caught their I, leaks. I expected so, it to be flat. And it right, wasn't. right, and it's, it's hard. It, I, I agree it's hard, and we are sorry that this is not working today, but we will get there, and this is, one of our focus there's, areas. There's a lot of a lot of effort being put onto the low end devices too. To, yeah, yes. and also I think like uh, in the past year we did a lot of work in the dev tools, and then we actually can capture some of the memory. Mm -hmm. uh, you can like using the dev tool today when run your website, and then try to capture the memory snapshot, and then to see where the memory, what well, part at least the, like relative to Chrome may not be relative to exactly what part of your code. But you can see where the memory goes. Yeah. yeah. You should also, I mean, also just like any good programmer, you know, you know, pay attention to how many references that you're keeping. You know, it's easy to understand in, in the code that you write yourself. But if you bring in a bunch of frameworks that you don't yeah. understand mm -hmm. how they work, you can, you know, all it takes is one reference, right, to pull the whole world with you, or you know, keep it around, and that's it's hard. Well, our tools that, can definitely get better. Sorry, a way we tackle a lot of this on the, on the server side is yeah. to you, you run a pool of like five workers, and once memory gets so high on one of them, you just kill it and restart yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm kind of pushing my own agenda a bit here, but like, can we have? I, I really want no. us to look at navigation transitions again, and I think we're starting to do that because in something like Gmail, if you're clicking on emails. You know, we, we could do full page reloads, and if we could do that fast, and we could do that in a way that's, you know, you could still have a fancy transition, then you've, you've got that sort of teardown. Because you're already just killing it constantly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get agreement on that now? <laughs> <laughs> this next question, this is a really, this is a good one. Um, it's quite spiky. Uh, I've got some unease about Polymer. It seems weird to have browser folks advocating a specific framework. Um, is it you know is the idea that it should just shim new APIs and sort of eventually become redundant, or does it make sense for a browser to push a framework? Actually, like I don't I don't think of Polymer as a framework. I think of it more of like a mix-in, yeah. right? Because it uses the platform. I mean that's the trendy thing to do now is to claim your framework's not a framework. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad we're on board with that. But, but in, all, in all seriousness, I think um, tomorrow uh, Adi Asmani I think is going to give yeah. a, a talk about uh, how to build progressive web apps on many of the popular frameworks. And ultimately, like, there's a million different ways to build progressive web apps well. And we're excited to see a lot of the stuff the React community is doing and the Ember community and, and other communities. The way I think of Polymer, actually, is um, there's, there's this gulf between browser vendors and web developers, browser engineers and, and web developers. And it's kind of weird, actually. When I first joined the team, it was kind of surprising to me because we're I came. C++ coders. Yeah, see, yeah it's, it's very different, right? And, and so actually, one of the reasons that we, we think the, uh, the Polymer team is part of Chrome is it helps us 
uh, test out all these new features and H, you know, HTTP2 push and web components and a number of these new features and give some feeling of what it would look like to do something that's as idiomatically as close to the platform as possible. Mm -hmm. And so to, to me, it almost feels a little bit like a, um, well, it's just like a, a way for us to just explore what, what you could do if you try to keep as thin of a layer as possible. Mm -hmm. But of course, frameworks add a ton of value, right? I mean, frameworks are in user land. They're able to explore concepts way, way, way faster than we can in, in browsers and in standards. And uh, they absolutely have an important place in this, in this whole ecosystem, I think. So um, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the audience right after this one, because this one's been, the font size has been made very big on this one. So I think maybe a lot of people have been asking it. Uh, a lot of people use Chrome on desktop. Oh, we released Chrome on desktop as well. What plans are there for installing PWAs on desktop Chrome, like add to home screen? Well, I mean, it already works, right? You can go oh, under that was easy. <laughs> it's done, yeah. It's nothing oh. we want to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in all seriousness, this is actually, um, we, we get this request a lot. Um, it's, on mobile, it's actually easier to imagine exactly what it, what it operates like, because on mobile, you tap an icon on the home screen, and then it goes full screen. That's just how it works. Like, that's what users expect. And there's not really that many sort of weird edge cases. On desktop, we have multiple uh, operating systems. We have tasks bar task bars and desktop launchers. Uh, we have full screen things. We have tabs within existing windows. Uh, does this thing pretend to be a totally separate application or within Chrome? There's a lot of other interesting questions to reason through. And we definitely want to do it, um, but it's, it's a lot more stuff uh, Interesting questions. I'm really excited that um, Microsoft a few months ago announced uh, in a blog post that they're going to be exploring progressive web apps on desktop. I think it's really awesome. It's going to be really cool to see. But, but how far can we get down like uh, uh, Electron? Like how you know how far can oh, we get down oh, that route? Launching oh, without tabs. So launching without Chrome. For example, today you can go and you can say like if you're on a Chromebook, you can say add to shelf, and your website now is on the shelf and it launches in its own window. On Windows, you can say add to desktop, and so on. Um, this, this doesn't work quite as well on OS X. I mean, that was even true when we were doing Chrome packaged apps because the OS doesn't quite give us the flexibility to present these experiences dis as distinct from the browser. But on Windows, it works really well, and so, and so too on uh, Chromebooks. And I think the other thing is, I wrote an ode to the desktop because I think, you know, we talk about mobile all the time, and that's great, but the, one of the great things about the web is that it can stretch and, you know, do this responsive design um, and give us access to all of these different things. And, uh, uh, I've seen certain you know, productivity type companies that go all in on mobile and then they leave behind their desktop applications. You know, this is what I live in all day. I use this for work. Like It may make sense to actually fix up the desktop side. So I'm excited to see as we kind of grow out I think the PWA story actually works really well much beyond mobile. It's, it's, definitely, on the, it's definitely something we want to do. So. Let's take some questions from the audience. Let's over there. Okay. Um, we uh, sp uh, spoke a minute ago about um, the uh, the gap between what was available in Chrome packaged apps, and you specifically addressed um, sort of the distribution model. But uh, there was also other APIs, of course, um, and some of them were very important in the educational space. So um, my company, as well as others, have built uh, uh, things for education using some of those APIs. Uh, those APIs are not likely to um, have web standards implemented before the end of life of the um, uh, uh, of the Chrome Web Store. Um, what do you guys think about a compromise of getting some of those APIs into uh, just standard Chrome extensions that we can message as opposed to, um, you know, they were only ever in Chrome package apps, Chrome Serial, um, Chrome Net, things like that. So, so there are a lot of things that are difficult to bring to the web platform given its paranoid security model, but that seems like an uh, approach that could work for some of those for some of those kinds of APIs. Is, again, with this, it's really we love this feedback and to get uh, thoughts and the, the APIs and use cases are really important to you. So. Yeah, I would just plus one that, and um, I work with the extensions team who build the Chrome extensions platform, and they expect that there's you know probably going to be increasing needs for extension APIs to solve some of these. Okay, things, so. I mean, if the just the existing ones were moved over with that same security model, it would be awesome. Solve so. some problems. <laughs> <laughs> you said security model. <laughs> 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 Um, uh, what would be helpful is, uh, it's a small team, we, you know, we, uh, so what would be helpful is to know what the most important things are, and that's, uh, I don't, can't remember who gave the talk on it, but yeah, via feedback is, so we can know how to prioritize things. Okay, and thank actually you. we have some of the product managers from that, working on that stuff here okay. today, walking around, so. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll admit I, I pinged some of them already, them but I'll bring it up. Yeah, I mean, Thanks. We, would, we would like to ship those APIs on the open web as fast as we can, right? Yep. But we have to be very careful. Like, we can't, it's yeah. very difficult to unship things from the browser. Sure, but you, you guys just realize that the, that gap but, so. of um, uh, functionality means that there's going to be a whole of no functionality until the, uh, yeah. when, when the Chrome Web Store goes away and the APIs don't show up as standard API, APIs, right? And, and we're, we're where the, the time scales are different. So that's one of the reasons we want to hear this feedback so we can mm -hmm. figure out which things prioritize um, that transition. Thank you. Second of audience question. Uh, my question is about uh, HTML imports. Uh, they were mentioned a couple times today, but uh, and maybe it's just me, but I sense less optimism than I have from you in the past. Do you still think, are you still hopeful that uh, HTML imports will be supported by the browsers the way they are today? So, uh, Dimitri, we've, we've locked horns. <laughs> me and you have locked horns over HTML imports and, and what they should yeah. do. So you can you can take as, this one. As the, as the proud father of uh, HTML imports. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't seem that proud. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think it's still a pretty cool primitive. And uh, it does uh, did advance a field um, you know, of, of how do you do modularity on the web pretty, pretty far. Uh, I do believe that. Uh, there is interest among browsers to implement something like imports. And the latest proposal that uh, I have so far is called HTML modules, which is effectively taking the semantics of ES6 modules and uh, transplanting them to uh, something that looks like HTML imports. Um, and uh, folks have been receptive so far. But right now, our biggest blocker is actually shipping and getting ES, ES modules out in the wild and trying to understand how this will actually work. One of the saddest things ever, I think, is that this is the first time we're actually going to be you, you, this, this week, <laughs> this week, you're going to say something that's the saddest week ever. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> let, me, let me roll those back. <laughs> Rebase. <laughs> one, of the, one of the saddest things in the thir last 30 minutes <laughs> is that we're, uh, we actually are not sure what the performance characteristics of ES6 modules will be once they're available, because uh, they are um, a new, brand new primitive. And even though ES6 modules are used pretty widely in the development uh, developers' um, um, build systems and environments, Nobody actually has done a good performance characteristic analysis of ES6 modules. And until we actually have a running code in the browser, we won't know. So that's step one. And once we have something good and we'll understand what is the next steps, uh, we will start thinking about uh, the HTML, modu HTML modules. And the precise timing of all the things that are loading across the wire, when they're ready, right. and when other things that are blocking on them. It's one of the things that's been, when I joined the team, just. Crazy right. complicated. A lot of this was uh, intuition in the beginning. And I think right now we're really like, if you look um, and um, look at what Sam was talking about, look at what Alex was talking about, we actually understand the space a lot better. So in a way, um, my answer today would be no, HTML imports will not survive the way they are. But yes, there will be something like it that is better. Cool. Thanks. Who's next? I am. Um, so a few years ago at Google I.O., uh, it was showed off that you can, that um, Chrome tabs and the app switcher are, are treated like every other app. Now that's no longer the case, um, what happened to that? Is that ever going to come back, or is that permanently gone, or what is going to be replaced? Or Grace, be replaced? Or... Yeah. So we tried that model. It's back then. It's in the Android I.O. time. Is when they introduced called a document uh, mode. Is uh, uh, let the app to go into the uh, to the system, and uh, we adopted that. We are first adopter from the app perspective, uh, but when we start to uh, get it to the wild, and then we realize is uh, not a lot of other apps adopting adopting that model, and for. Android also some of uh, major like uh, devices like Samsung devices they don't have the quick affordance the recent button is not available there so that make a lot of user cannot finding their tabs so based on that uh, kind of like feedback it is a kind of decision because we actually run this in uh, in the wild for like over a year but there was we collecting a lot of feedback coming back. Uh, we change back, but uh, we are going to re-evaluate. If you're looking at uh, like uh, today's Chrome, I think we actually uh, run the new. It's like if 
a tab is opened by another app, we actually will put in it similar as uh, in the Android recents. So we'll try to introduce this. If you user using Chrome as a Chrome browser, and all their tab will stay in Chrome, but if they're using uh, like hub and spoke model, that's what we call it, it's like they're using say uh, Twitter and click the link, just view the content, and then that will show up uh, as an individual document. Mm -hmm. And then when they hit the back, and then that will just go disappear. Yeah. I think ultimately it's about user expectations. And uh, with, with that model, every single site you visited, even if it was like accidental or that celebrity gossip site that you aren't very proud of, that, you know, that one time is, is it's kind of there in the same mix I'm of proud internets. of it, man. I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, and I think the model that we're at now is, in many cases, users are just tapping around to a couple places they don't intend to come back to, and like that still feels like a website to some extent. But now, as you grow a stronger and stronger connection to this, when you add to home screen, that's more of a strong signal of like, no, please promote this to be like a thing that is, is treated like an app. So I think to some extent, is, uh, this is like a, uh, us exploring this space, figuring out what yeah. works for users, what works for developers, trying to figure out the right mix for all of that. Yeah, there was another factor, if I could pile on. <laughs> We uh, introduced a feature called Chrome Custom Tabs a little while ago, uh, which has seen really rapid adoption. Um, and prior to that, some folks were you know, flirting with using WebView for uh, tracking content in their experience. What we found with Chrome Custom Tabs is that people really like to, they didn't want to intent out of their app into the browser, because then users sort of got lost and didn't know how to get back to that app. But with Chrome Custom Tabs, they had that X in the top left corner. It's really easy to pop back to the app you're at. So it works really well for this hub and spoke style of browsing. Um, but once you start to have a lot of folks going in that direction and, and adopting Chrome custom tabs, and, and I don't know about you, but I've seen that more and more, um, no longer do you have that experience where um, you sort of the segregation between the browsing that happens outside of Chrome and the browsing that happens inside of Chrome. And so then we sort of, we, we, that led us back to this model of, well, if I launch Chrome, I want to be able to find all my tabs. I want to be able to find the activities and the tasks I was doing there. And then we, we thought, well, maybe we can even evolve the task management within Chrome around that notion. Because it's actually really hard. We can't evolve the task management uh, of the OS. In many ways, we're just saddled with whatever old versions of Android implemented for that. And as Grace said, some old hardware didn't even provide a, a convenient affordance. So anyways, look for us to do some some uh, you know explorations in the task management space. I want to be able to use voice, you know? Just be like, show me that celebrity site that <laughs> Uh, you poked on on no, my computer. Just have no. it come back, you know. Have it come back. Just, so, this is a genuine story. When I when I uh, I started Google, um, I just realised that every story I tell involves a bathroom and a toilet, but this one does as well. I uh, I, I started and, I, and uh, um, I went, went to the urinal and I saw that the the person standing next to me was wearing Google Glass, and I just went, "Okay, Glass, take a photo," <laughs> and he just went. Dude! <laughs> <laughs> Works. This is a question from the audience. So my question is about uh, page performance. Um, earlier we talked about PWA and mobile performance and uh, the need for having less JavaScript and less parsing. A um, lot of times websites have this one megabyte of norm size, but uh, the rest of the megabyte comes from the advertisements. So the biggest mm -hmm. challenge that we face on many websites is page performance. Yeah, I can go PWA, I can go offline, but also we have users uh, 2G, 3G. What are your guidelines and how can we bring it, uh, are there clear guidelines from uh, DFP that allow us to say, we don't really recommend you to put heavy ads or you know, you have the AMP ad, that's excellent. You only allow certain type of ads to work, so the AMP pages are faster. So what are your guidelines to make sure the ads somehow don't affect the main page flow and are faster and it doesn't uh, impact the user? So, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a very complex area. There's a lot of moving parts, and we're focusing on, we're digging into it on a number of levels. Um, so in particular, we're looking at ways to isolate third-party iframe uh, and their performance from the rest of the page and making sure that they reduce the amount they can jank the page. We've also implemented a few um, APIs and designed a few new web standards like Intersection Observer that makes some of the things that uh, many of these ads do 
um, like viewability calculations that many other thing, sites do, much, much, much more efficient. But we're depending on the ads to go and do the right the thing. Ad and networks. Think, and the ad networks. Yeah, ad networks. Yeah, networks. Yeah. Yeah. There's usually countably few. In the case of the intersection observer, a lot of them are using flash on desktop to measure position. And so, and for example, we've changed our public, our, um, our uh, plug-in power saver uh, heuristics to also target some of those. Now that you can do intersection observer just very, very efficiently, um, we're actually changing the heuristics for plug-in power saver to disallow small flash uh, plugins, which is one of the things you see on desktop that leads to some performance problems. Another thing we're looking at, uh, in, in many ways, we're looking at making some targeted interventions. Uh, roll back the clock. Remember uh, pop-up blocking? Yes. This was browsers intervening to try to help, right? Move the ecosystem to a better model. Um, and you could argue whether that worked, but um, <laughs> but the point is that things like what we're talking about here are ways where we get involved, right? And another uh, example that we've been talking about is in, in the standards groups even is is around blocking a synchronous script that's injected through document.write. A lot of times these analytics packages or ads will go and document.write one script and then another one and another one. You get this awful sawtooth pattern. Um, so we're exploring ways to kind of like say, hey, that's not okay. You don't need to do it that way. How about we just start breaking that? And it's yeah. that one in particular we're, we're shipping, I think, very relatively soon on 2G connections will basically kind of ignore uh, or won't wait for that document.written script. Um, and actually, if you as a developer or open dev tools on a page that does that behavior, um, we will, even if you're on 2G, we'll warn you, by the way, this behavior, we might intervene in certain character conditions to change this behavior. Yeah. There's a lot of other work happening in this space. But right. yeah. This is obviously a really complex uh, situation because just like uh, Rick and Robert came on stage and said, we want this to be predictable. And we're with our interventions coming in and saying, hey, we're going to break you randomly. It's going to be great. No, no, only if you do the bad things. <laughs> but, yeah. but if you don't know what the bad things are, you know, it does look random. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem, but we are really interested in solving it. Uh, we, we hear this loud and clear. This is a really hard problem. But there's an exploration really on GitHub as well. Sorry. There's an exploration on GitHub as well, like uh, looking at a spec where you can have an attribute on an iframe mm -hmm. to say, to kind of set some limits on it. It's very early days and sort of how to attribute usage to a particular iframe or to a particular origin is not easy, but it is, we are looking at it because you, you're right, it's, it's so important. Yeah, so you can imagine saying this iframe can load no more than three megabytes. Yeah. Or whatever. Exactly. So a page can go one day it can be loading in uh, five seconds, the next day is fifteen seconds. So mm -hmm. there's no telling and there's no way to monitor what comes in and what goes on. Yeah, absolutely. But thank you. Well, I'm gonna take the, the last question from the audience. Go for it. Um, I'm just kinda curious for some inside perspective on uh, kind of the seeming contrast between Android instant apps and kind of that side of the house versus the Chrome team. Uh, I realize we I'm asking I, I, that's that's. I, the I, I, there you go. I, I mean, I realize I'm kind of asking, you know, half half, half the uh, group here, but I, I am curious, kind of, what your what your uh, perception is of kind of the internal dynamics there, um, because Did as as users. Model? We care. <laughs> um, so, shall I go? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think that it's no surprise that the Android team's investing in instant apps, right? We talked a lot about low friction and how that's so valuable, or friction and how that's such a problem. Um, and so they're on a, a, a path to try to figure out how to bring uh, instant loading uh, native apps to, the, to, to become a reality. There's a lot of challenges there. Security model, somebody said, yes. Yeah. Um, Size. The, yeah. the reality is um, that's also just, you know, the reality is that we're, you know, we're all sort of thinking about the same sort of ideal model, one where you can happen on an experience very easily, discover an experience, and then as a user choose to retain that experience and, and re-engage with it easily. And that, that act of retaining grants additional powers and things like in the case of PWAs, today it's full screen, tomorrow maybe it's notifications and perhaps other things. But the point is, as a user, you make a, you discover content within the context of the browser or in the case of instant apps. And, Similarly, within the browser, because you're following URLs, and then you might, as a user, retain it, and that makes that transition to being a thing that you're keeping on your device. So, in a sense, we're we're all kind of converging on a similar uh, model for computing, but there are some fundamental differences between web and Android. But if I was a betting woman, I would bet on PWA. <laughs> well, so that well, takes us quite nicely to the, the, what. I think it's a, a good, well, a good, nice last question, um, and that's what's the best way to convince my management to jump on PWAs? Because 
it's management that has the money. It just makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes I mean, sense. I, I think so, cost-wise, cost wise, if you think about just like iteration and like update, updating, I imagine that uh, developers can sort of um, you know, capture the cost of being able to update and evolve whatever product or, or service they have and how challenging that is like on native apps. It's prob uh, you know, probably the you know the one of the, the most one of the best recent examples of that was the big quiz, right? <laughs> no one had to reinstall an app when you guys <laughs> ran backstage, right? Just sort yes, of like and, and just uh, an app, a native app would have had the same problems that we had today. I just <laughs> want to, right, to stress come on, that. Please, man. <laughs> <laughs> In seriousness, we have a number of case studies, a number of them are new today, that Tao covered in her talk, uh, and we're gonna have a blog post in a couple days that summarizes it as well. A lot of these things, like that, that stat about the user acquisition cost, for example, uh, these are very powerful to people <laughs> uh, who are in the, making the business decisions in this. The other thing to remember is, um, I'm starting to see progressive web apps as a term. It's coming up in press articles, it's coming up at conferences, at marketing conferences, at other places. Um, Imagine at some point, if you already know these technologies, have built a, couple, a prototype, know what it would look like for your company, at some point, someone from business in your company is gonna come to you and say, what's this progressive web app thing? And say, oh, well, actually, here's an example of how our thing would look like. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think the, be the, the best thing you can do is probably, I mean, today, people aren't experiencing progressive web apps on a daily basis yet. And I think, um, and, and sometimes it's really hard to imagine your site inside or what your site should look and feel like and how it could be instantly better. I mean, West Elm is such a great example. I mean, they built a demo first, got sign off, and then now they're gonna do, uh, they did an early beta, gonna move public beta and then move their site over. Because once you see something so amazing, you don't wanna go back. I mean, I think that's the, that's, and, and so I think you sometimes you just need that visual like demo. You don't have to take your entire site, take a couple of APIs, just put it together and just make it beautiful and immersive and engaging. Um, and I think it's hard to say no once people see that in, in, on, on their device. Um, and so if you, if you can take somebody 20% and build a demo or a prototype, I think that's the way to go. Make it real, make it yeah. very concrete. Because abstractly, people are like, home screen icons yeah. and <laughs> offline. But when they see it for real, it, it feels yeah. very different. I think that's a good note to end on. Can we have a huge round of applause for the panel?